Welcome back, everyone. We're so excited to be with you. It's a very important session, real local, concrete, place-based examples of regenerative models, regenerative approaches to rebalance the human relationship with nature. I'm so honored to introduce our host and one of our speakers sharing his place-based model in process, Barney Swan. Barney, uh, we're so happy to have you back, part of the family here at Sun Valley Forum over the years. Barney is International Director for Climate Force, a globally recognized thought leader in areas of leadership, innovation, and sustainability. He is the first person to walk to the South Pole powered solely by clean energy technologies. After skiing 600 nautical miles, using cutting edge technology from NASA, Goal Zero and Shell, Barney's mission to conduct a polar expedition entirely on renewable energy was an extraordinary success. Upon returning, he's been invited to share his story at World Economic Forum in Davos, and the South Pole Energy Challenge marked the launch of the Climate Force Challenge, which is his solution-driven mission to clean up 360 million tons of CO2 before the year 2025. Serious Mission, also son of the wonderful Robert Swan, OBE, the first person to walk to both the North and South Poles. Um, so Barney, we are so pleased um, to have you with us. We miss your father. Please send our best to him from the whole forum family. And thank you for hosting this important session. Wonderful, thank you so much for that introduction. Amy and a really wonderful group to to start the day. It's uh, I'm in Australia right now, calling in from tropical far north Australia. And why don't we just jump straight into it? We had a discussion with Eric and Lexi yesterday about some of the amazing projects that they are undergoing. And Lexi, if you are ready, it would be wonderful to hear some of the amazing collaborative work that you're working towards in Idaho and why you are just excited that this is a model that can be scaled and it deals with a lot of amazing things like food security and conservation and you're ticking a lot of SDG boxes and really would just love to hear a little bit more about uh, why you're excited about this and what people can, how people can get involved. Thanks, Barney. I don't know if my slides are going to work. Um, I'm going to try one more time to share my screen. I doubt it'll work. And if not, I'll just wave my hands and you guys will imagine how great they were. Um, and um, we'll see if they ever pop up. Hard to say. <laughs> I'm just going to jump in. Um, so as Barney said, I'm Lexi Pergastis. I'm the executive director for the Sun Valley Institute and the local Food Alliance. Um, today I've been asked to speak about my home and my community, and I'm so grateful for this opportunity. So my home is um, central Idaho in the Wood River Valley, and home is nestled in the mountains enveloped by the high desert plains and all under this wonderful endless one western sky. Oh, look at that. There's slides. Um, and so, Mike, I'll just kind of throw it at you when to – when to change them. Um, so recently the Sun Valley Institute and the local food Alliance had the opportunity to present a 2050 vision through the Rockefeller foundation, open IDEO and second muses food vision prize platform. And the, this vision was co-created with our region's many stakeholders after countless conversations and shared what ifs. Um, so we can jump to that next one, Mike. Our vision is um, our vision is robust, exciting, and truly transformational. It is rooted in community resilience and necessarily requires a dynamic regionalized economy nested within a vibrant community and living in balance with a thriving ecosystem. It was imagined through the context of a food system for not only was that the prize brief, but also because food touches everything and as a system can really regenerate our home. Uh, let's go to the next one. The systems, the things about systems is that they are perfectly designed to get the results they are getting. And our current system isn't meeting our needs. We saw that when the coronavirus hit our community with intensity and force in March. And we believe this vision builds a system that can meet our needs today and into the future. And we've got six pillars to our transformational vi vision. And so, Mike, if you want to jump to the next one. And it's so... Oh, it, yeah, it's going to show kind of some poor animation here because it's all PDFs. So sorry, guys, you'll have to <laughs> bear with me here. The first is good food. And really, that's nutrient-dense, dense, bioregionally appropriate food that is produced regionally and accessible to all. And then the second, 
So Mike jumped to that next one is founded um, on a dynamic economy that is guided by circular economic principles and includes businesses which are focused on the triple bottom line. And Mike, if you want to go to the next one, it involves a community that is at once connected to each other, authentically inclusive, and has a deep sense of place. And the next one, it is nourished by our agricultural land that has transitioned from conventional to regenerative practices that heal our soil and our environment. Next, it is enhanced by technology that is solution-based, open source, and peer-to-peer. -peer. And finally, it is supported by the many levels of government who believe in and share this vision. You wanna to go to that next one? We believe, and we truly do believe a vision can transform a system and it'll take time. And some of you guys heard Eric speak earlier and we'll hear about it again, but Eric's work is a testament that it does take time. And our roadmap is, this 30 year vision and the roadmap is in place and the work has begun. And for us, the early milestones are critical. And so Mike, if you want to jump to that next one. Um, and we'll build on one another so that, that as we progress, momentum builds and continues to build. In the coming months and years, we will ensure that we continue to de develop a deeper understanding of our system to identify strategic leverage points for change. We will be focused on investing in our community, both time and money, so as to enable access to capital to advance resilience initiatives. It would require, it's gonna require continuing to build regional collaboration and broad scale buy-in to the vision so that it continues to be shared and co-created. And finally, it's offering support and uplifting ongoing and new community activities that bring us closer to the vision. And so I've been asked a lot how you create a 30 year plan. What do you need? What are the landmarks? How will you know you're on the right track? And I actually see a lot of similarity with parenting. Um, I've got two young kids and so I am new in the parenting world, but and so there might be a few on the line that have some, <laughs> some advice. But um, in general, you have a goal in parenting, which is you, ra you wanna raise a good human being and a set of values that you think that will get you there. And then it is constantly attending to those values each and every day, one day at a time. And as the days blend into months and years, you continue to build on your successes, you learn from your missteps, and you continue to orient to your North Star. And just like in parenting, resilience has no finish line. There is no pat on the back, you've achieved your goal and now put up your feet. Resilience is necessarily a growth mindset, for it is about being able to withstand respond, recover from uncertainty, volatility, and the unknown. And there will always be opportunities for continuous improvement. And really, in order to be successful in raising resilience, we as an organization and as a community have to be brave, we have to be humble, we have to be creative, and we have to be willing to adapt. And so we are well on our way. And this vision and this work as well as my young children are what get me out of bed in the morning. And I couldn't be more grateful to play a role in bringing this vision to fruition in our, in the community that raised me and will like rise, raise my children. So thanks for that. Wonderful. I love that coming back to the kids and um, yeah, just what their world is going to be like in 30, 40, 50, a hundred years. It's um, a really important thing to, just keep in our minds. So thank you for looking out for the future generations. And um, I think we've got some questions come in here. So why don't we just, uh, I think, uh, Ant Ant uh, Antonia got one here. It's interesting thing, things in concept on a digital platform. Most people don't cook their own food. Most people don't grow their own uh, food. We need more people hands-on involved in their processes. Uh, that's a kind of... Um, uh, experiential learning that we need so maybe just to add on that comment what what do you think is some really practical hands-on uh components of what you're trying to push and and how can we get that citizen science component how do can we get people bringing in bringing in data from around idaho and how can you really um connect connect those citizens to the fantastic project that, and 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 make them feel like they're going to be on that um that long journey with you yeah and that's a that's a great question and really it, so there's a couple different ways that we're approaching that and the 
first and this was launched because of coronavirus and so for those who weren't in our community um our the wood river valley had the highest one of the highest per capita rates of infection of coronavirus in the country um during march and so we were it was pretty intense here for a little while to say the least and what we saw was that these initiatives that were kind of grassroots growing up with um we had this um initiative that we're calling the 5b resilience garden and what that was is trying to get people to now use this opportunity to say how can we build resilience in our own backyard and actually like have a garden again and mm. teach people how to do that and so we're supporting that initiative we've done things like trying to make the online the farmers market um we've supported having an online platform for that so that people can feel safe but really also then as we did the our food vision one of the things we did is we went around to our various stakeholders and asked does this resonate does this feel good and a group of those um stakeholders was a a group of high school students and what was really fascinating was they all you know we asked them where do they imagine themselves in 30 years with their food system and they all had this image of a very deep connection and close connection to their food but then when asked that follow up question of do you imagine yourself working in it no mm -hmm. one imagined themselves in it they weren't mm -hmm. actually participating in the food system except still as consumers and so we feel like that is an opportunity for this place based education to say there's a there's space to actually bring our youth into this um vision by actually engaging them in a food system and bringing it into our educational systems or mentorship processes etc wonderful and i think the more that we can connect kids to getting in the soil and actually seeing the whole process of where food comes from and animal agriculture as well i think a lot of children <clears throat> are very disconnected from cows and chickens and lambs and where their meat comes from and i think it doesn't need to be intense how we introduce them to it but just gaining that bigger connection is just so 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 important so you have my full support and i'm sure everyone listening is uh, excited as well so uh, thank you very much for sharing lexi and yeah. i think we're going to go over to eric and hear a little bit about his awesome project in costa rica and all of the magic that you have created up to this point and the vision moving forward uh thank you barney i'm going to try again to see if i can share my screen because i don't think my slides have made it and if that's the case, um, then yeah, it looks like the, the screen share is not working. Um, so, well, I apologize. Uh, I have lots of pretty pictures, but you'll have to endure a talking head uh, for about seven minutes. So, <laughs> um, I think I think and, Mike 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 might might be able to pop it up in a second. So um, yeah, I don't, maybe if you just I don't think it's I don't think it was moving fast over the over the email wires. I think everybody must be on on the Barney, network. Go. So, um, sorry, <laughs> a Amy, what were you going to say? Sorry. Sorry. I was just saying, did you want to go Barney? Cause your slides have made it. So I didn't know sure. if you wanted to go. Sure. sure. I'm, I'm happy. To, I'm happy to go. And then hopefully Eric's will, Eric's will okay, be well, uploaded by then. I can continue trying, but I don't mind just talking if, if that's what, if that's what we need to do. So, all right. Okay. Barney, thanks. Would, would you like to go Eric or I'm, I'm, I'm happy to go. Um, Excellent. So what, what, can I just see the slide or is it just going to have to be, can, can everyone see the, the, the glacial photo right now? Um, Cause I can't really see the slide from this. There we go. Perfect. Excellent. So to give a little bit of context, Amy did say that I've done quite a lot of stuff in Antarctica. I think it's important to come back to that um, very powerful place. It's um, 14 million square kilometers has a, 90% of the world's ice, 70% of the world's fresh water is locked within that ice. Within that ice. Um, it's beyond powerful. And I think sometimes it gets under overlooked, this bit of ice, the Larsen Sea Ice Shelf um, breaking off in 2017 was uh, four and a half times the size of Singapore, a trillion tonnes of ice. And next slide, please, Mike. Um, this this power of what was going on there really inspired me to make a positive journey to Antarctica. This was our NASA-designed solar ice melting system. 
Uh, next slide. We survived off this for two months, skiing 1,000 kilometers. It's a very savage expedition. Next slide, please. Um, you know, if you fall in a crevasse down there, you don't come home. Next slide. Uh, dealing with frostbite on my feet, getting frostbite on my face. You know, this was an exceptionally hardy expedition, really humbled me in, in a big sense. Next slide. Um, and just really understanding uh, what that how remote it was and how devoid it was of life has really inspired me what I'm doing right now. Next slide. And standing at that South Pole was an incredibly big anti-climax moment. Um, two months of skiing, two years of preparation. Next slide. But it really has inspired me to make what I'm doing now 100% uh, more relevant. And this is the property that I'm currently looking at um, to not currently looking at. My entire life has revolved around this property. It's 450 acres. On the right, you'll see the mountains. This is World Heritage Wet Tropics, um, the oldest rainforest in the world, 180 million years unchanged. And that little river system to the left is the Daintree River, which heads out to the Great Barrier Reef, which is another World Heritage Zone. And I'm really excited to be purchasing this property for just shy of... 700,000 US dollars, 450 acres. I can plant um, a million trees on this property. And I really want to make it, give it, giving it back to not only nature, but really opening it up to allow tourists and, and ESG people and corporates and, and students to really come and see what that restoration looks like as it's playing out and opening up some trails, opening up some mountain bike trails. Um, and, and, America does it really well. Your regional and national parks are great. Australia quite hasn't quite got there with some some areas. And I'm really excited to make this as a collaborative space that people can see all of the amazing work that nonprofit workers are doing around the region, whether it's in the rainforest or with wildlife or with the reef. You know, we're restore, restoring reefs out here and, and doing amazing things with hydrogen tech and, and solar panels. And I really just want people to feel excited that they are some um, remarkable things going on indeed in Australia and around the world and I really just want this property to be a hope spot that can be really be touching on all 17 of the sustainable development goals and and making the Paris Agreement and um, environmental social governance strategies and criteria and things like water source protection and biosecurity all of these things can sometimes be a bit not not super relevant to the everyday person and I really just want to make this into a place that is co-elevating and really telling that that bigger story, but allowing people to come and plant a tree or come and uh, charge their EV vehicle on on the property. So this is what is keeping me up and going every day um, on top of consulting work, managing expeditions down to Antarctica, Iceland, Kilimanjaro. Make, uh, it, it all comes back to making the story tangible. So that's just a little bit of an introduction to what's keeping me busy. Next slide, please. And um, really just very humbled to have the opportunity to be working with people like Jane Goodall. This was us planting uh, 3,000 trees in Tanzania uh, at uh, February last year after climbing Kilimanjaro. It was very humbling to be around her, uh, a, a true um, war horse of, uh, of conservation. She had a sling on. She was still out there planting trees. Next slide, please. And uh, really just comes back to what our future looks like Um in a hundred years, you know, my grandma is 105 in October. This is a her hand, um, my my hand holding a her hand, and um, I just really want to do everything I can. So if I get to 105, I'm really proud that I haven't been, um, you know, passive within what I can do to influence the future. And um, there was just a question that's come in, and then I'm going to shoot over to Eric. I know we're a bit wrapped on time, but I'm really trying to make this. Um, uh, inclusive not only to locals and tourists but to the um to the first nation people of australia and from all of the phases of development uh, that first initial land purchase i've got three other phases they're going to be a part of um guiding me and guiding the perspective on what they want the land to 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 be regenerated as and um they're also going to be rangers and yeah, making the whole thing interactive in that sense for those Indigenous Australians. So really excited to be working with them, students, everyone in between. And um, thank you so much for listening, hearing a
bit about my regeneration project up in the world's oldest rainforest. I'd love to, uh, if anyone would like to get involved, um, please shoot me a message and we can go from there. And this is the beginning of my journey. And, and now we're going to hear a little bit about Eric, who has been at it probably longer than I've been alive. And um, really just uh, humble, humble by all of your work, Eric, and was very excited um, after our conversation yesterday and very humbled by what you are doing in Costa Rica and would love for you to share to everyone listening about everything that keeps you busy. Sure. All right. Well, thank you, Barney. It looks like the slides are not going to make it, so I will just talk for a little bit and try not to be uh, uh, too mundane. Um, I'll just start by saying that uh, and this is a great panel. It's, t it's very timely, and, and I appreciate the, the comments of, of Barney and, and Lexi. And I think, you know, as we all go deeper into this pandemic period, and, and particularly as we see some of the fault lines that are emerging around around inequality and access to services, that I that I really believe that the that the role of conservation in regenerative systems, especially at, at a regional landscape level, are going to be, you know, really a key part of the societal response uh, to all of this. And you know, COVID is putting a big exclamation point on on all of that. And so I think you know this topic is very, very timely, and I appreciate being here. Um, well, if I had a slide available, I would I would pull up uh, an ecosystems map of. Uh, Area de Conservación Guanacaste, or ACG as we call it for short. It's located in northwest Costa Rica. Uh, it is also a World Heritage Site uh, since 1999 and considered uh, really one of the most biologically diverse places in the Western Hemisphere. Um, our northern border is uh, less than 20 kilometers from Nicaragua, and, and as you can appreciate, this affects the cultural dimension because many Many Costa Ricans in this border region um, are of Nicaraguan descent, or they're the offspring of, of refugees from the Sandinista Civil War of, of some 30 years ago. And, and the map, if, uh, if it was in front of you, would show four very distinct colors, four distinct ecosystems. And uh, this area is special because it's the only protected area in the tropics that has, this, has a 30-kilometer a, a, a east-west transect of wholly distinct ecosystems that are connected to each other which of course is a big reason why the biodiversity is so high. So we're talking about an estimated half a million species, which is roughly equivalent to the species uh, that you'll find in all of the United States in just a little area about the size of Chicago and its suburbs. Um, so a real you know, kind of biological hotspot. And, and the tropical dry forest, uh, which is actually actually wet right now, wet and green because it's, it's the rainy season, uh, and it's the namesake of our organization because the dry forest – remains uh, as one of the most endangered forest systems globally. Um, and, and this is in part because the dry side of Costa Rica and, and, and Mesoamerica in general was the first place that was systematically deforest, uh, deforested by Spanish colonization uh, beginning in the 16th century, along with um, you know, indigenous genocide from disease and violence. So, um, so uh, ACG uh, now has uh, roughly 75,000 hectares out of out of 169,000 hectares total that are that are in tropical dry forest, and that is the largest block of intact recovering dry forest between Mexico and Panama uh, right now. So this is a point where I'd give you like a whirlwind tour through some really pretty slides and show you some of the uh, some of the different ecosystems and forest uh, zones and so forth. But um, I'll just point out uh, that we're we're also surrounded by a heavily farmed landscape. And, and um, I would show you a, fo a photo of an orange plantation that runs right up to the edge of the protected area. And other parts of ACG, it might be, it might be pine pineapples or bananas or sugarcane or a teak plantation. Unfortunately, uh, most, if not all of it, is not organic. Um, and, then, and then I really can't talk about the history of ACG or its biodiversity without noting the roles of, of Dr. Dan Jansen and Winnie Hallwachs. Um, they are two renowned tropical biologists who have made serious uh, contributions to science. Uh, they're also the founders of our NGO and, and really the chief thought leaders who over the span of almost 40 years have, have various, variously coordinated and cajoled and collaborated with every level of Costa Rican government and raised millions of dollars to buy land to grow ACG into the size it is today. So they, when they started, um, it was a little... Uh, park, uh, Santa Rosa National Park of roughly 10,000 acres, 10,000 hectares, excuse me, and now it's 169,000 hectares, so, you know, multi-fold uh, uh, expansion. 
And and as Dan would say, um, he and Winnie were classical ivory tower paper publishing biologists until about 1985 when they had an epiphany and they realized that all the species that they were studying and writing papers about and discovering would all be gone if uh, if they didn't do something. And so they became conservationist and they developed a plan to grow ACG from a you know a biologically insignificant small national park to the large landscape integrated system of parks, refuges, and wildlands that it is today. And they 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 had a blueprint, a, a kind of a uh, in 1990, 1985, and uh, for this uh, idea of a national park, and it and it started with a photo of a of a little Guanacaste tree growing out of a cow patty on the cover of the of the of the promotional brochure, and and most of the dry forest had been long ago turned into cattle pasture and covered with non-native African grass, and 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 to the point where people that live there, generations of people that live in the dry forest, forgot that a real forest actually ever existed there. And so some of this was like pulling back, pulling back and rebuilding the landscape and helping people remember what needed to be on there. So with the exception of uh, a very few people, this idea of landscape level restoration was not well accepted by the conservation mafia of the day. Um, at that time, and again, I'm talking kind of mid late eighties, uh, most environmental groups felt that you should only put your money into saving remnant primary forests. And there was really no hope pl for places that are already trampled and used by people. And, and Dan and Winnie basically said, well, give us enough money and time and we'll put a forest back. Um, it won't be pre-European in its richness, but with enough time, it will be very, very close to it. And of course, in the intervening years, you know, the whole concept of landscape restoration has gone on to be a major, major principle in how people think about ecosystem management today. And um, to make a long story short, I would commend uh, a book uh, called The Green Phoenix uh, by Bill Allen, uh, which I which I think of as kind of the Sand County Almanac of Central America. Um, this book this book chronicles the first 20 years of this incredible effort that Dan and Winnie and several Costa Rican leaders, including uh, former President Oscar Arias, um, Nobel Prize winner, put into uh, making ACG a reality. Uh, it's an easy read. It's it, it kind of a series of essays with the same lyrical quality as Aldo Leopold has written. So I really encourage to kind of you, you can get the kind of social political history of, of how ACG was uh, was developed. Um, and, and really just to wrap up and kind of apropos to the theme of this session, um, Dan and Wynn and, and colleagues early on that, that if ACG was going to survive the slings and arrows of modern society, um, particularly one, you know, uh, where, where the global appetite for more food and wood fiber continues to grow every year, that, that a protected area, that a, that a kind of complex, uh, multifaceted protected area like this needed to be fully accepted by its surrounding society. In, in other words, um, you know, conservation had to, has to pay its way. And so along with a, a monumental land buying and forest restoration effort, there had to be a process of, of what we call biodevelopment, uh, where people actually benefit from having a large wildland at their doorstep. And, and the way you do that is to make sure that the local people are in charge of the place and they have real jobs and careers in biomanaging the resource. And so uh, the last photo that I would show you, a group of about, about 40 people, um, all resident Costa Ricans, and all of those people uh, would be from small, are from rural, small rural communities around the perimeter of the protected area. And most of them have no more than an eighth grade education, but they've all been trained to do graduate level field research. And they are our daily staff um, for a dozen remote research stations around, around the ACG protected area. Um, so as the major supporting NGO to this place, um, we are simultaneously, we kind of wear a variety of different hats. We're simultaneously co-managers of the land with the federal government. Uh, we support a serious bio-inventorying of species on both land and sea. Um, we do this with many institutional partners. Uh, we also provide operational support to a bio extensive bioliteracy education program that I talked about in a previous session uh, for all the small schools that surround ACG. And we continually uh, and incrementally build ACG as opportunities arise. In, in fact, we just, just closed on a, on a gorgeous piece of 70 uh, hectare um, forest last week that is in the transition zone uh, right up on the continental divide between the dry forest and the wet forest. So, uh, so there's many more stories to share, but that'll give you a sense of, of kind of the, the work that we're doing. And, and uh, thanks, thanks very much. I'll, I'll turn it back to Barney. Thank you, good sir. And just uh, I haven't I haven't had too many questions come in, but just one from from me. 
uh, I know we've got to wrap up pretty quickly, but just uh, what 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 would be your advice for for people like me and um, and Lexi who are kind of getting started on our journey and just how how to keep motivated and just any 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 pearls of wisdom for for us on our journey ahead. Well, you know, I, I really think of our work as a, as a as a work in progress, and there's a lot of you know if I if I had you know were to talk another 15 minutes, I would talk to you, talk to you about all the kind of different ways we're trying to suffuse some of the key elements of this model into society and, and into the national kind of body politic. Um, there's some really exciting stuff happening in Costa Rica because right now we have a very friendly uh, uh, political governance system that is really uh, really keen on this stuff. In fact, the president of Costa Rica just gave a a talk about the about the importance of biodiversity and climate change to the World Business Forum last week, and and within the last month, the the Minister of Environment, uh, Carlos Manuel Rodriguez, was just tapped to head up the global environmental facility. So, um, all of which says that you really have to build kind of those local partnerships from from the ground and 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 from the beginning. And um, as you can imagine, given the history of kind of gringo interference in Mesoamerica, we have to be extremely careful about kind of punching the nationalist um, hmm. colonialist, you know, uh, uh, button. And, and so uh, that means that uh, the profile that we have in Costa Rica is, is deliberately very, very low and very behind the scenes and, yeah. and really one of, of, a, of a manner of facilitating, facilitating uh, the things that, that we can, where our help and technical expertise can be useful, but, but really letting, letting the locals run the show. And, um, so I don't know if there's lessons learned there. Um, I mean, there's Definitely. there's many kind of replicable models. You know, the, the value of really knowing and understanding what you're managing biologically is, I think, a really important principle too. And and you know, and that can be the basis for involving a lot of different people and involving kids and and communities as well. So, thank you. wonderful. Thank you so much, Eric, and really been an insightful conversation. And we've been talking about restoration, and I think we're going to be heading over about natural security and how we can be protecting not only land that we're restoring, but protecting what we have left. So really excited to be hearing from the next panel. And thank you both so much for an awesome conversation. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thanks, Lexi, Eric, and Barney. And we'll see you in the next session with security leaders and why we need to restore nature for our security. So thanks so much. See you shortly. Bye-bye. Thank Bye. you.